the first thing you learn at basic training is what it feels like to live on the bottom rung of the ladder. There you are, surrounded by high school valedictorians, celebrated athletes, A-plus students, each and every one of you referred to only by the name New Cadet, each and every one of you crawling through the same muck and grime, each and every one of you wearing the same ugly haircut. I know it hasn't changed. Each and every one of you stripped bare of any sense of pride or conceit. According to the brass at West Point, the justification for this demoralizing divestment of self-esteem is to teach us that we're all the same. And for the most part, it works. When we're deprived of our achievements and possessions, when we're tired and dirty and bereft of any acknowledgement or self-worth, we all seem pretty similar. We look the same, we sound the same, we stink the same, we make the same mistakes. But there's another consequence of reminding more than 1,400 overachievers that they're at the bottom rung of the ladder. They start to look longingly towards those higher rungs. Reminded of our uniformity, we yearn to distinguish ourselves. And as you probably guessed, Uncle Sam makes good use of that too. Even within the Army's already predetermined hierarchy of rank and title, there's an equally compelling, unstated hierarchy of achievement and status. One that gives rise to wonderful maxims like, if you ain't airborne, you ain't expletive removed. I'd love to tell you that as a young soldier, I was immune to this conditioning, that I saw right through this clever bait and switch. But if that were the case, I probably never would have jumped out of a perfectly good airplane or dangled out of a helicopter at 100 feet, or deployed to Kuwait or Afghanistan. Yep, I bought in just like everybody else. Because, as it turns out, even though the military possesses a vastly different culture than mainstream America, it motivates its soldiers with the exact same question that motivates contemporary American citizens a question that speaks to our innermost ambitions and desires, a question of, what do you want? What do you want is probably the most common question we face as Americans each and every day. After all, when we're choosing what to eat for breakfast, we ask ourselves, what do you want? When we're deciding what to do with our lives, our parents, our teachers, our friends, they all ask us, what do you want to be when you grow up? When we're choosing whom to love, we're asked, what do you want in a friend, in a partner? Before every decision and indecision, before each action and reaction, before each and every choice we make in our lives, the question, what do you want, helps us determine the best choice by calculating which outcome will leave us feeling the happiest. And we're much better off for it, not just as individuals, but as a civilization, where would we be without our ambitions or desires? Would we have airplanes or computers, cars or vaccines? Would we have the vast abundance, prosperity, and freedom that we enjoy today? Would we have Army Rangers or Navy SEALs? Not likely. No, our world rests upon the accomplishment brought to us by aspiration by those who are constantly striving for that next rung on the ladder. This is the world that what do you want has brought us. This is the legacy of our ambitions and desires. The problem with what do you want, as many of us have already discovered, is that this fantastic question that confronts us at every moment of every day, this question designed us to help find, well, this question that's designed to help us find happiest possible outcome. Well, it doesn't actually leave us feeling happy. There's always another achievement, always another pleasure to discover. For me, yeah, I'd made the airborne. I'd even been deployed, 
saw combat too. But what about jump master? What about ranger school? What about the special forces? And the trick to the army was that there was always another rung on the ladder to keep you hooked. At the end of the day, asking and answering the question, what do you want, can bring us gratification, but it cannot bring us contentment. Respect, status, food, compliments, clothing, cars, all of these offer us joy, but only for a limited time. Like entering an air-conditioned room on a hot day, we drink in the satisfaction of our achievement for mere moments before quickly becoming numb to their existence. And to make matters worse, in an age of increasingly persistent comparisons, when merchants flood our mailboxes and our televisions with an endless stream of goods and services, when acquaintances inundate our phones and our social media streams with a limitless catalog of parties, vacations, carefully curated selfie catalogs, and celebrity status notifications, achieving our heart's desires seems to last less and less. We wonder to ourselves, why don't I have that for breakfast? Why don't I drive that car? Why am I not there on vacation? How does he have so many friends? How does she look so good? How did they achieve so much? One by one, we become aware of each and every rung we have yet to grasp on the ladder of our desires, and we churn with dissatisfaction. But we're not alone. According to recent surveys by, funded by the National Science Foundation, less than one-third of all Americans would describe themselves as happy. Our pursuit of happiness has left us less and less satisfied, leading us to become the most in-debt, obese, addicted, and medicated adult cohort in United States history. It's pretty ironic, really, we live in the freest, wealthiest, most prosperous society in the history of human civilization. We can be nearly anything we want. We can do nearly anything we want. We can go nearly anything we want. We can have nearly anything we want. And yet, we remain unfulfilled, discontented, disappointed even. The toys we wish to buy, the successes we wish to achieve, even the respect we wish to earn, the joy it once brought us has long since vanished, leaving us panting as we reach for that next run. This too is the world that what do you want has brought us. This too is the legacy of our satisfaction and desires. Are we destined then to remain bound by desire and ambition? Are our lives nothing more than an endless quest for satisfaction, fated to leave us clutching for that last rung on the ladder? No, says Judaism. Our tradition teaches that within each one of us rests a unique gift, a singular piece of the divine light sown throughout the universe, and that our sacred task, the purpose for which we were placed in these mortal shells, is to release that light, to bestow our gift upon the world. The fulfillment of that task, our sages tell us, will bring the contentment of our souls and a lasting happiness that will nourish us throughout our entire lives. So how do we do it? How do we, creatures of flesh and blood, preoccupied by desire and ambition, find lasting happiness? How do we unearth and contribute our unique gifts to the world? Well, as we might imagine, Judaism has something to say about that, too. And it says that we begin by asking ourselves a new question, one that's just as important to our happiness as what do you want? The Hasidim tell a story about the great 18th century Ah, pardon me. 
They tell a story about the great 18th century scholar, Rabbi Zalman, who was jailed in St. Petersburg for his beliefs. While the Rebbe awaited trial, the chief of police entered his cell and asked him, Rabbi, after Adam, the first human being, eats of the forbidden fruit, he hides in the Garden of Eden. When God enters the garden, God asks, Ayeka, where are you? Rabbi, why would God ask that question? Shouldn't God, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful, know where Adam is hiding? The Rebbe leaned in and said softly, we Jews believe that the Torah is just as meaningful for us today as it was when it was written. Will you accept that your answer might depend on this? The police chief nodded gruffly, said, sure, go ahead. Well then, said Reb Zalman, the answer to your inquiry is that God isn't asking where Adam is. God is asking where you are. So, where are you? In every era, in every age, God calls to each of us, where are you? Not because God is ignorant, but because God knows that in fact, we have misplaced ourselves. So many days, so many years, so many decisions and indecisions, so many successes, so many failures, and where have they brought us? Where are you? It's a question that cultivates ideals rather than satisfaction or achievements. A question that nurtures character rather than desire. Unlike what do you want, which asks us what we can get out of life, where are you is far more concerned with what life is asking of us and with what we can give our loved ones, our community, and our world. Where are you demands to know in each and every decision that we make, where is the person that we're striving to be? Where are the virtues that we claim define our character? The renowned columnist and author David Brooks suggests that we can live our lives according to two sets of virtues, each inspired by one of these two essential questions. Our resume virtues, inspired by the question, what do you want, catalog our accomplishments, the skills we bring to the marketplace, the possessions and featured experiences we share with our friends or share online, the diplomas and plaques that bear our names. On the other hand, the eulogy virtues, inspired by the question, where are you? Those are the virtues that people talk about at funerals. Kindness, bravery, honesty, faithfulness, deep and abiding love. We all know that our eulogy virtues are more important than our resume virtues, but our culture, our educational system, even our biologies, focus far more upon teaching us the skills we need to cultivate our resumes than to write our eulogies. We're more skilled at building our professional, academic, and social CVs than we are at writing what will be our obituary. But if we teach ourselves to ask, where are you at every available opportunity, then our eulogy virtues can begin to define our character and help us radiate our inner light. We're blessed to live in Los Angeles, not just because it's a temperate paradise, but also because it's home to some of the greatest storytellers in human history. These storytellers make their mark with a vast array of skills and techniques, but one of their most fundamental skills is the ability to comprehend and portray character. In fact, Frank Daniel, the past dean of the School of Cinema and Television at USC, once remarked that all successful stories start and end with character. 
A strong sense of character provides a stable foundation for nearly any narrative. As consumers of stories, we intimately know this. We've all read or watched stories where we could actually predict what a character would do before that character even did it. Because we knew who that character was. We knew the virtues that defined them. Likewise, we instinctively recognize poor depictions of character. When characters take actions that completely catch us off guard, that seem totally inconsistent with their values, when they act out of character, we experience dissonance. Typically, this happens when a writer privileges plot or motive over character. For instance, well, actually, I should take a poll first. How many people here have seen the movie The Empire Strikes Back? Enough. Good. All right. So I'm sure you, those of you who have seen it, or will admit to have seen it, have seen the scene where Han Solo is about to be frozen. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Princess Leia calls out to Han, I love you. And he looks at her sorrowfully and says, I know. It's the perfect Han Solo response because that's exactly what someone like Han Solo would do. Except it wasn't actually supposed to happen. Since we're living in LA, I'm going to assume that probably a lot of you already know this, but for those of you who don't, the script actually told Harrison Ford to respond to Carrie Fisher by saying, I love you too. But Ford, who knew his character so well, knew that the response was out of character. And so he changed the line on the set. And thus, instead of a contrived sense of schmaltz, we got one of the best scenes in popular film. That's the power of character. And that's the power of asking ourselves, where are you? In a similar vein, when Moses descends from Mount Sinai and discovers that the people have made a golden calf, God offers to wipe out the people of Israel and start over with a new people with Moses as the progenitor. Now, I don't actually have to tell you what happens, do I? For any of you who haven't read the story, you probably already know. Because we know what type of person Moses is. We know that Moses is humble. We know that Moses is compassionate. And we know that above all, Moses cares deeply about his charge to the people of Israel. That's the power of character. And that's the power of asking ourselves, where are you? When God approaches Moses, Moses doesn't ask himself, well, what do I really want in this situation? Instead, Moses asks himself, where am I in this decision? What would someone with my values, with my virtues do? And so Moses refuses God's offer and saves the people of Israel once again because that's exactly what someone like Moses would do. As pervasive as the question, what do you want, has become in our everyday lives, so too can be the question, where are you? When we're choosing what to eat for breakfast, in fact, a still small voice might be asking us, where are you? When we're deciding what to do with our lives, where are you? What can you give to the world that no one else can? When we're choosing whom to love, where are you? Who are the people who are going to help you be the very best version of yourself? Before every decision and indecision, before each action and reaction, before each and every choice we make in our lives, where are you demands to know. Do our deeds align with our most important virtues? Do our actions reflect our character, the type of person we want to be? It's not an easy question to ask ourselves. When our children are late for school and the baby is crying, the oldest lost her homework, it's hard to worry about virtues. When we've worked tirelessly without recognition for years and the new boss asks us to take a pay cut, it's hard to worry about character. And when we're tired and dirty and bereft of any acknowledgement or self-worth, it's hard to ask ourselves, 
where are you? And yet, if we wish to offer the greatest story of our lives, if we wish to bring our unique gifts into the world, then we must find a way. My senior roommate, Jeff Biggs, wasn't airborne or ranger qualified. He'd never been to the Q course or sapper school. In truth, he didn't have much on his army resume at all. While the rest of us chased every school we could find, looking for another badge to sew on our chests, Jeff just did his work. That was all right by Jeff. He was a quiet man, and accolades never seemed to really pique his interest. But man, you always wanted Jeff on your team. Always on time. Always prepared. Always pitching in. Always ready to help whether you were writing reports or moving furniture. In fact, Jeff was late to his own birthday party once because he was busy helping out his classmates prepare a report. Of course he was late, because that's exactly what someone like Jeff would do. At the end of our military coursework at West Point, we had a graduation ceremony where the commandant of the school awarded a citation to the best overall leader in the class. When the time came to announce the coveted leadership award, he didn't call out the name of our class president or even the top student. He called out the name of Jeff Biggs. A leader of character, the commandant said, rarely seeks or receives recognition. He finds it only in the satisfaction he receives from knowing that he did the very best job of staying true to his virtues. Today, we look back upon the past year to examine the story of our lives. Will we read about a masterfully portrayed character, one whose values and virtues dictated her actions, one whose decisions and indecisions, whose actions and reactions, whose choices were eminently predictable? Or will our story meander? Will we shudder, aghast at the dissonance we experience as time and again we privilege desire over virtue, resume over eulogy, motive over character? These days of awe call upon us to make shuva, to return to the path that we have so assiduously strayed from. One of our sages, Rabbi Yitzchak, suggests that in order to return, we must make two changes in our lives. Shinui Maaseh, a change in our deeds, and Shinui Hashem, a change in our names. It's not enough, Rabbi Yitzchak tells us, to return to a life filled with good works. Rather, we must rediscover ourselves and become the person that we were always meant to be. This year, may our lives be guided by what we wish to read in our eulogies just as much as by what we wish to read in our resume. This year, may our choices inspire us to ask, where are you? As readily as we ask, what do you want? This year, may the protagonists of our stories be guided more by character than by motive. This year, may we stop clutching for one more rung on the ladder and enjoy the happiness that comes from rediscovering ourselves and from bestowing our unique gifts upon the world. Then shall we truly inscribe ourselves in the book of life and happiness. Kimi Hill, Sona. May this be God's will. Shana Tovah.